Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Sixpack Warriors. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 204. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. I do solemnly swear that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and that I will obey the orders of the President of the United States and the orders of the officers appointed over me, according to the regulation and uniform code of military justice. So help me God. As we've observed before, religion and politics are inseparable in this modern climate because it's a matter of good versus evil. This week, you'll listen to Michael Vorce echo what I've been talking about, nagging actually, for a while now. I frequently tell you that Catholics must be doing something in this era when the church is in such great need. Now I'm telling you about something specific you can do. I've never asked God to bless the work I'm doing, but rather asked Him to let me do the work He's blessing. If you're inclined to do something for the church that's media-based, I recommend podcasting. Yes, you can launch your own show like this. Podcasting reaches the demographic we need to reach, the 18 to 34 age group. If you're like I was, you know nothing about podcasting. I took a course called Podcaster's Paradise, taught by one of the most successful podcasters in the industry, John Lee Dumas. After only three and a half years, I've gone from 40 listeners to over 80,000 listeners. John made me an expert in podcasting, so I recommend Podcaster's Paradise for you too. Then you can begin doing something important for God. Just click on the Podcaster's Paradise link in my show notes at cantankerouscatholic.com. I want to remind you to send me your questions for Bishop Strickland. We're running low on questions, really low. There's only enough questions for another month for the Sacred Heart Wins. If there aren't any questions for Bishop Strickland, there won't be any more segments with him. He'll go elsewhere. So send me your questions. There are a dozen ways to reach me on cantacruscatholic.com. 
Back on October 26, I laid out a blueprint for saving the church, at least here in America. To those of you six-pack warriors in other countries, this blueprint equally applies in your countries as well. Again, I laid this out for you on October 26. Then, lo and behold, Michael Voris backed up what I told you in his vortex on October 31st. Maybe he heard that episode. In essence, Michael told you the same thing I did, but he used a sad political poll to make his point. We're going to listen to that October 31st vortex, then I'm going to come back and sew everything together with some strong spiritual thread. One of the most interesting things about political seasons is all the polling, and quite frequently the questions are not just, who are you going to vote for? A recent poll surveyed Catholics in the battleground states of Florida, Georgia, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Arizona, and Nevada, and asked questions about the faith in addition to political questions. They probed those faith questions. Four such questions actually are what we'd like to highlight for you state by state. Remember, this is just Catholics answering. And on the question of abortion, an option was given of abortion should never be permitted under any circumstances. In Florida, look at these numbers here. In Florida, only 10% of Catholics agreed with that statement, which is church teaching, by the way. In Georgia, it was 6%. In Pennsylvania, 7%. Ohio, 7 Arizona, 5 Nevada, 7 Another question asked was, do you accept all the church's teaching? And that is reflected, of course, in how I live my life. Very important, right? Look at those who responded yes, and notice the absolute disconnect from the abortion question. In Florida, 14% of Catholics said, yep, I accept all the church's teachings, that's how I live my life. Georgia, 12%. Pennsylvania, 12%. Ohio, 11 Arizona, 13 And Nevada, 15 So across those six battleground states, an average of 13% of Catholics say they accept all of the church's teachings. That's pretty bad news, actually, for the other 87%. Yet on average, across the same battleground states, only 7%, about half, say they say they believe abortion should never be permitted. Only half the Catholics claiming they believe everything the church teaches, except everything the church teaches, certainly in the matter of abortion, which, of course, strongly suggests they may very well reject other church teachings while claiming to accept all the church teaches. You talk about a disconnect. Apparently, those who accept all of the church's teachings have never heard the one about abortion. Here's another kind of side-by-side question. This one from those who say they believe in the real presence of our blessed Lord in the Eucharist. First, the numbers on those Catholics who claim to believe that teaching, dogmatic teaching. In Florida, 52% say they believe in the real presence, the real presence of our blessed Lord, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist. In Georgia, 58%. Pennsylvania, 52 Ohio, 52 Arizona, 52 And in Nevada, it's 55%. So, in all six of these battleground states, a majority of Catholics say they believe in the real presence. Great! Well, let's look at the response to the question, of how frequently do Catholics at least go to Mass once a week in those same states. Look at this. In Florida, it's 34%. Georgia, 49%. Close, but not still not half. Pennsylvania, 36%. Ohio, 37 Arizona, 35 And in Nevada, 32%. Those are all the Catholics who say they go to Mass at least once a week. So, doing the averages again across all the battleground states, 53% say they believe in the real presence, but among those exact same Catholics, only 37% go to Mass each Sunday. Again, disconnected and unplugged from their faith. It's extremely clear from these kinds of surveys, and we went through all of these in deep, deep detail. We do it so you don't have to. It's very clear from these types of surveys, even many who say they believe don't really know what it is they believe. But tellingly, across the political spectrum, they're spot on. In general, broad terms, two-thirds of Catholics in those battleground states, the people they polled, say they reject Biden. 
They believe the, the economy and inflation is the most pressing issue, and they are backing the Republican candidates across the board. In that regard, they may even be a bit ahead of the rest of voters, but not that far ahead of them. It's astounding that so many Catholics can be so in step with things of the temporal order, and when it comes to things of the spiritual order, be so completely out of step with the church's teachings. And this is the point. While thinking they're still good Catholics, that too was a question on the survey about believing some or most of the teachings, yet still considering themselves good Catholics. Take a look at these numbers. In Florida, 63% of Catholics say they believe some or most of the church's teachings, but still count themselves as good Catholics. In Georgia, it's 68%. In Pennsylvania, 67%. Ohio, 69%. Arizona, 68%. Nevada, 66 So it goes. So roughly two-thirds of Catholics believe themselves to be good Catholics, while rejecting various church teachings at the exact same time. You'd have to search high and low through the annals of church history to find a greater, more epic meltdown of the faith. No matter how you cut it, measure it, examine it, slice it, analyze it, this is an unmitigated disaster. Even Catholics who think they are Catholic have no real idea of what being Catholic really is. We've known for decades that's been true of the clergy, especially the bishops, but that has now become the standard among the laity as well. What this means is that the few Catholics who are actually are Catholic must have a much greater responsibility to instruct those other Catholics. Remember, to whom much is given, much will be demanded. We told you at the beginning of this episode that we learn all kinds of things during election seasons because of all the polls. We're willing to bet there's some stuff here you weren't expecting coming out of a political poll. Weren't those poll answers from our fellow Catholics dismal? The poll answers Michael went over highlight the very most important spiritual work six-pack warriors can and should do today for Christ and his church. And that work is to perform one of the spiritual works of mercy to instruct the ignorant in the teachings of the church. Go back and listen to episode 200 again, titled, Here's How to Save the Church, then implement what I told you in that episode. This episode publishes on November 23rd. Advent begins on November 27th. Everyone's going to go to Christmas parties, shop for presents, eat a lot of unhealthy goodies, and generally get into the Christmas spirit. But the Advent season isn't a joyful season. It's a penitential season, just like Lent. The world sees all of December as the Christmas season, but it's not. The joyful season for Catholics begins on Christmas Day. Until then, from November 27 to December 24th, we're going to do penance in preparation for the joyful season of Christmas, just like we do during Lent in anticipation of the Easter season. I can think of no better penance during Advent than to resolve to give up some of the parties, present shopping, sweet treats, and getting into the Christmas spirit, and further resolve to replace those things with a better learning, understanding, and living of the faith in preparation for performing the spiritual work of mercy by instructing our fellow ignorant Catholics. If you want to really enjoy Christmas and find genuine joy in your Catholic faith, then do as I ask you to do. No, I'm not asking you, I'm begging you. You've heard this from me before, but it bears repeating. Because God is eternal, he doesn't experience linear time as we do. He sees all things, past, present, and future, all at the same time. So he saw everything going on in the world and church today, even before he created Adam. On this side of death, God is all merciful. On the other side of death, that time that comes for us all without warning and sooner than we expect, he's all justice. Because God's all mercy before death, even before he created Adam, he had already determined to create you and me to live right now. He created us to live in the church militant right now to fight for him, the church, and soul. Because we're Catholics, we have various obligations to God and his church. All of our obligations boil down to two primary obligations, to try our level best to become a saint and to try to share the faith. 
Getting to heaven requires more than remaining in a state of grace. A lot of Catholics think that staying in a state of grace is all we have to do because so much emphasis is placed on that. You absolutely can't get to heaven if you're not in a state of grace, but getting there requires more than a state of grace. So listen to this carefully. You have absolutely no hope of salvation if you're not in a state of grace, but also if you're not trying to become a saint and if you don't share the faith, period. Jesus made these conditions for salvation. He made becoming a saint mandatory in Matthew 5.48, and he made sharing the faith mandatory in the Great Commission. Anyone who tells you differently either doesn't know what he's talking about or is lying to you. I realize that most of you disagree with me about this, and I'll tell you shortly how I know, but you really need to reason this out. Do any of you honestly think that all Jesus would require for salvation is to avoid sin after everything he went through for our redemption? Think about everything he went through in his passion, the agony he suffered in the garden, the bogus trial before Pilate when he heard the people he came to save demand his death, the beating he took at the hands of brutally cruel soldiers that nearly killed him, carrying his cross through the streets of Jerusalem to the place of his death, then nailed to that cross and left to die by the most painful and cruel means the Romans knew in those days. Can anyone reasonably believe that all that's required of us after Jesus went through all of that is simply to avoid sin? I've got news for you. Most Catholics end up in hell because they believed all they had to do was avoid sin. Unlike Protestants, Catholics don't read the Bible and meditate on it. If they did, they know about the other things required for salvation. This is what Jesus was talking about in Matthew seven thirteen and 14 when he talked about the wide and narrow gates. If your faith isn't hard for you, it's a foregone conclusion that you're bound for hell. I love you six-pack warriors. I don't want to see any of you go to hell. Now, let's talk about how I know most of you disagree with me about trying your best to become a saint and sharing the faith are necessary to get to heaven. You've heard me speak about becoming a saint ad nauseum, yet not one of you listeners have ever contacted me on how to do it. Admittedly, you may already know how, or you have a priest you trust who's helping you. But what about sharing the faith, the one thing I know better than 99.9% of Catholics? In episode 200, I offered you a means to help you share the faith. I told you that if you'll send me proof that you've enrolled in the Marian Catechist Apostolate Basic Catechism course, I'll send you a free copy of the Lay Evangelist Handbook to help you share the faith with fellow Catholics. I told you that in the alternative, if you go to the Joe's Stuff page on cantankerouscatholic.com and buy five copies of The Secrets of the Catholic Faith for your first future students, I'll include a copy of the Lay Evangelist Handbook in your order. Out of more than 80,000 six-pack warrior listeners, not one single person took me up on these offers. A few people bought one copy of Secrets of the Catholic Faith to check it out, but absolutely no one accepted my offer. Do you think I was just trying to sell books? No. If only 1% of you took me up on my offer, it would require all this apostolate's budget in order to give away all those books. I don't care about money. I care about souls, apparently more than most of you care about your own souls. My offer still stands. Share the faith. Okay, maybe you're too afraid to share the faith the way I told you in episode 200. I get that. It's feckless, but I get it. There are other ways to share the faith. If you're afraid to do the face-to-face thing with other Catholics, do something else. Start a podcast, begin a Catholic blog, launch your own YouTube channel to share the faith, but do something or count on hell in your future. Yes, it's hard, but Jesus said it's supposed to be hard and with personal cost. Go back and read Matthew 7 verses 13 and 14. I'll lose listeners over this episode, but I don't care. I'm telling you what you need to hear. As some Catholics have noted in the reviews you've written about the cantankerous Catholic, I both offend and say things listeners don't want to hear, but you're thankful that I say them. Now put your money where your mouth is. Share the faith. Become a saint. 
I'm available to every one of you for advice. It may take me a few days to get back to you, but I'll always answer you. I'm feeling much better than I was, but I'm not out of the woods yet. I may even have to do my next episode from a hospital bed. Who knows? But I'll keep doing what I do until I take my last breath, and I do it for the sake of your soul. So don't let me make these sacrifices in vain. Get up off your butts right now and do whatever is necessary to begin your journey to sainthood and to share the faith. Don't let your sloth, your laziness, cost you your soul and the souls of ignorant Catholics. Everyone searches the internet to solve problems or fill needs they have. For many of you, I've already done the heavy lifting. Discounting the evil things searched for online, people generally search for things that tell them how to make money online, health and wellness products, and trading and investing. Some are interested in having their own podcast. I've got your back on these things. Visit cantankerouscatholic.com. Go to the episodes page, then click on the title of this episode. Below the podcast player, you'll see my show notes. I've already listed products and services in various groupings. Check them out. You can help yourself and this apostolate at the same time because if you like what you see and purchase the products or services, this apostolate will get a small commission. Check out those links today. It's time for the Sacred Heart Wins with Bishop Joseph Strickland. Each week, His Excellency answers your toughest questions about the Catholic faith, the problems in the church, spiritual questions, catechetical topics, or anything else you want to know. If you have a question, just email it to joe at cantankerouscatholic.com. Now here's Bishop Strickland and Joe Pack, the Every Catholic Guy. Hello, Six Pack Warriors, and here we are again with the Sacred Heart Winds and our favorite bishop, Bishop Joseph Strickland of Tyler, Texas. How are you today, Excellency? Good, Joe. How are you? Oh, I'm just as happy as if I had good sense. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's dig right in because I know your time's valuable. By the way, for you listeners, we do a whole month of these at one time, so you know, I don't like to keep His Excellency any longer than we have to. Bishop Strickland, Elizabeth asks, why hasn't Bishop Koenig responded to many questions from the faithful in his diocese, Wilmington, Delaware, regarding the reception of Holy Eucharist by President Biden? And what can we do to explain this to our children and grandchildren to keep them faithful to Catholicism? Well, um, I really don't have answers for uh, the bishop there and, and why he hasn't responded. I encourage people to continue to respectfully ask the questions. On the question of what you tell your um, children and grandchildren, I think to, to just be very clear about what the church teaches. If you want to quote some of the catechism, even some of canon law, and uh, but, you know, probably people won't go that deep. But I think ultimately, just to remind everyone, children, grandchildren, spouses, friends, um, that the the human organization of the church is always trying to be renewed and to uh, seek um, conversion, a deeper conversion. I'll speak for myself as one human bishop. Um, we're always imperfect. We're always sinners. We're always seeking a deeper conversion. And so to uh, encourage everyone we talk to to understand that the church has basic teachings that when we sin, we fail to, to live up to. And we're all in that boat together. All of us are sinners. There's not a sinless person on the earth. The Immaculate Virgin Mary was the only one fully human and fully sinless by the power of God. She's in heaven and she's praying hard for us. Amen. Um, certainly our Lord 
it was sinless, but he's also divine. The rest of us, all of us are sinners. So it's a broken, sinful church called to further conversion and deeper conversion. That's, I think, the best answer, not just in the specific circumstance that the person mentions, but in all the flaws in the world. If we were all perfectly living the beautiful, marvelous teaching of our faith, we'd be in heaven. Uh, that's really where Amen. the goal is for all of us to get on the, the right path. But, you know, it's it's a, the world's greatest understatement to say we're a long way from that. We are tragically far from <laughs> where we're supposed to be. But all of us, myself included, are on the same path of seeking that deeper and deeper conversion. Absolutely. And Elizabeth, I'd like to add to this uh, the part about how, uh, I'm sorry, will you say, and what can we do to explain this to our children, grandchildren, to keep them faithful to Catholicism? If you want to keep your children and grandchildren faithful to the faith, make sure they know and understand it completely. I want to tell you something. I have been teaching the catechism for nearly 35 years. Some people have called me a walking Catholic encyclopedia. And let me tell you what that means. The reason I have been so faithful to teaching the faith for 35 years is because I know the faith inside and out. And for me, it's the most exciting lived experience that anyone can ever possibly have. And so if you want to keep them faithful, teach them the faith. Make sure they know all the faith because it's impossible to leave the church whenever you know everything the church teaches because it's so exciting. I'm sorry, Excellency. <laughs> I didn't mean to take over. Amen. Jeanne uh, <laughs> asked, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, Jeanne asked, my daughter, son-in-law, and their five children, my five grandchildren, are state of vacantus. Are their souls in jeopardy? Also, with the current pope and the decline in the church, why are we not all state of vacantus? Uh, they also state that I'm not getting valid sacraments because priests ordained after Vatican II are not validly ordained because of using the new right and not the old right. Please help me understand all of this. And Excellency, I would ask that you first explain what state of vacantness are, because I doubt many listeners know it. Yeah, well, that basically is a belief that the the the, the chair is empty. Sede vacante, uh, the sede of Peter is is vacant. Um, and I guess, you know, I've, I've had people give those arguments. Really, the the simplest answer I have, and it, it probably won't satisfy the people with questions, but going back to really believing and knowing what the church teaches, Christ established the church, and he promised the gates of hell would not prevail and that Amen. he would be with us in the church until the end of the age. I believe in Christ's promises. I don't believe that in the different versions of Sede Vacante belief, um, you know, you, you talk to different people of when it became vacant. Some it goes way back several decades. Some it's more recent. Um, I don't believe, I, I don't believe that that Christ would leave the chair of Peter vacant. Um, what we have in Going back to your previous answer, Joe, study history. There have been terrible times in the church. Yes. I mean, go back to the fourth century with Bishop Athanasius, and he was about the only one that was faithful during the Arian crisis, the Arian uh, heresy. So when we start seeing, and things are bad, there, there's a lot of confusion, and I could go deeply into my concerns. They're real. The concerns are real. But compare what's being said, what's happening to the faith that we know, 
and stay with the faith that we know. That's my best answer. Amen. Thank you, Excellency. And GN, I'd like to add, tell your daughter and son-in-law to read, actually read the documents of Vatican II. If they tell you they have, I propose they are lying to you. Because there is no way anyone can read the Vat, uh, the Vatican II documents and come up with being a Seda Vacantus. It's not possible. Vatican II was not only a pastoral uh, council, but it was really a completion of Vatican I because it was interrupted by the Italian Revolution. And they never got to finish their work. But much of what is in Vatican II is a restatement of Vatican I. Now, I don't believe any state of Vatican believe that during Vatican I, the chair of Peter was empty. So let's go back. Get them to read Vatican II because very few Catholics have, and they all really have, pretty much have a moral obligation to do so, especially if they're going to make statements like your uh, daughter and son-in-law are making. I, I've i read them. You can read them. That's not that difficult, not that big a deal. You've read novels longer than Vatican II documents. Okay? Uh, sorry, Excellency. There I go again. <laughs> <laughs> Tom asks, why is it that when good priests are sidelined or canceled, they are never just released so they can work in another diocese? It seems like the bishops that do this just want to hold it over their heads so that they can't work anywhere and force them to give in to their unjust demands. That's really a pretty good question. Well, and uh, again, I don't really have the answers, but it's it's a reminder that we bishops need the prayers of the faithful, uh, genuine, uh, heartfelt prayers, because uh, there are different difficult challenges that bishops face. I, I, you know, I certainly don't know what's going on in every diocese. I probably don't know everything that's going on in my diocese. <laughs> but I will tell you that if I hear of any issues that are seriously contrary to the faith, they're going to be dealt with. They have been and they will be. Um, yeah, it's a difficult position because I, from what I've seen, there are valid situations where bishops are addressing with priests that have been problematic. Priests can be problematic. Bishops can be problematic. We're all human beings. Um, and it, it is a difficult situation that... Uh, I really honestly don't have the answers to. I think what we the best we can do is support all priests. Um, if we are ordained priests, then we are obligated to to live faithfully that the call of holy orders to live uh, as priest of Jesus Christ. And so pray for your priests, pray for your bishops. I just don't have the information to know of specific circumstances. Um, there, there are situations where uh, the bishop is doing the proper thing and not having a priest continue in public ministry. It gets complicated to uh, go to another diocese. Um, actually, I can say that I've welcomed priests for when it can be worked out. And sometimes there's situations where it can be. Um, and I'm sure many bishops have welcomed other priests from other dioceses when maybe it's just a situation that it's not working in their home diocese any longer for whatever reasons. Uh, certainly, that has to be very careful because if there's any um, really uh, misconduct, it needs to be dealt with right there in that diocese. But it's not always misconduct. Sometimes it's just pastoral style or issues that the that have surrounded that priest and it's a better situation to go to another diocese well, i'm sure many bishops have welcomed other priests as i have um and so yeah, there are just a lot of answers that i don't have honestly well excellency i think tom is probably ref 
referring specifically to what happened in lacrosse. We had Father James Altman, who no one can deny that he's a tremendous uh, priest, a tremendous speaker. He's very faithful. Uh, in fact, it was Cardinal Burke, whenever he was the bishop there, who uh, uh, initially took Father Altman on. And, uh, you know, we have the situation with Father Altman and then Monsignor Grinder, Jeffrey, uh, what, what, Burl? I think, and he used to work for the USCCB. He got a new parish. Father Altman still can't work. You know, I yeah. think that's what he's referring to specifically. And that is a doggone good question. Why does that happen? Of course, you can't answer for the Bishop of uh, La Crosse. That's, you know, that's a fool's game. <laughs> but, but uh, uh, you know, I do understand where Tom is coming from, and it leaves me scratching my head from time to time. Well, frankly, Joe, we have to acknowledge without naming names, but we both, I'm sure, have a list of very deeply concerning decisions and situations that just things don't match up. I think the best thing for us as faithful Catholics, or for me as a bishop, for you as a layman, or whoever is asking these questions, um, to be faithful ourselves, to be Amen. clear about the truth and to be as faithful as we can, acknowledging that we're sinners in need of reform in our own lives. But um, I know it's troubling, uh, but we can go all over the place and find instances of troubling decisions that maybe if we knew enough, we'd get some answers. But I, I, I'm frankly, you know, I'm at a at a loss to understand why some decisions get made, but <laughs> like you said, you know, I I don't have the authority or the information to be able to uh, to correct it. It's just very troubling. Yes, it is, Excellency. We've been doing th uh, three questions per week, but this <laughs> time we have a fourth question. It's a question of my own. May I ask it? Sure. Okay. Recently on LifeSite, you said that Catholics should correct bishops whose teachings don't conform to apostolic faith. Shouldn't Orthodox bishops publicly call out those same bishops so the lay faithful aren't scandalized? Well, um, yes. I was really following on what Cardinal Burke said, <clears throat> that we're in a place where, and, you know, it, it is, you know, delicate to be, because I guess, honestly, Joe, I don't want to point a finger and call out another bishop without really knowing, you know, the whole story. Um, but I think the, that what faithful and other bishops need to do, we need to emphasize what the church teaches. If I mean, in some ways, it's easier to go international with those sort of things than it is to to get into our own country here, because, you know, I don't know the situation. I don't know internationally the situation, but when bishops are saying we're going to bless same sex marriages, all of the bishops should be saying, no, that's contrary Amen. to our Catholic faith, period. Amen. Not with. I mean, we don't have to really know a lot about the specific circumstances. If a bishop is saying we're going to bless same-sex marriages, I mean, the Vatican has spoken and said we can't bless sin, and that's what it comes down to. And so, yes, I mean, I think there's a point where maybe a bishop somewhere else needs to hear that correction. And so... We we do need to speak. I guess the, the best thing you hear a lot of times in, in politics, speak to the issue. And that's what I try to do. When a false statement is made, I try to speak to the issue. Or when I read an article that says, you know, this really is a question that people are dealing with, then I try to address where, what does the church teach in this situation? Make it a a moment to learn more deeply. Um, and that 
to me is is the best thing we can do when we don't know the circumstances that another bishop is dealing with if what is is at least being reported is contrary to the faith then yes yeah, speak up and address it i mean you know i i do it all the time <laughs> um president biden says if if this election goes and the democrats stay in power he is going to work to codify Roe versus Wade, basically making abortion, not just a Supreme Court decision that allows it, but making the availability of abortion the law of the land in the United States. That president and anyone who supports him that claims to be Catholic needs to be corrected by every bishop, by every faithful Catholic. Amen. And the best correcting there is to vote properly, vote with a formed conscience that knows our Catholic faith. And if politicians are vowing to do things that are absolutely contrary to our Catholic faith, then don't vote for them. Whatever party, whatever background they have, don't vote for them if they are saying things that are contrary to the faith. Amen. But Your Excellency, specifically, I can't recall the bishop's name, but he's the Bishop of Lexington, uh, Lexington, Kentucky. He does a lot more than say <laughs> that we ought to have uh, same-sex union blessings. He comes right out and says that the Catholic Church needs to change its teaching on homosexuality. And I have not heard one, not one single member of the USCCB call him out for that. Why? Well, that's a good question, Joe. Um, I, there are a lot of things like that that uh, I think we need to speak out more as bishops. And again, go back to what does the church teach? And that's contrary to church teaching. And the church even teaches that these truths are not some sort of, you know, changeable menu that we can say, well, we're going to change this now. It's divinely revealed. And that's what every bishop, every priest, every lay faithful needs to be reminded. We're dealing with revealed truth and it can't be changed. And I've seen I, maybe no one has directly um, addressed what this bishop you're talking about said, but I have seen articles where where bishops and cardinals have said, I think it was Cardinal Mueller most recently, you can't change Catholic teaching. It's the truth. You can't change it. Um, you can have all the votes you want, but it's, it's not going to change the truth. Even if the church officially says, okay, yes, we're going to change this. It still doesn't change the truth. That's and that's right. what we got to get down to. Yeah, it would be like trying to say two plus two is now going to equal five. You can't do that. Uh, truth is absolute. And because it's divine truth, it's divinely absolute. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Excellency, I, I, I apologize for putting you on the spot that way, but I felt it needed to be done. <laughs> you know, I love you, but... Uh, I got, I got to, got to get out there with it. Uh, six Packers. That's it for this week. Uh, for the sacred heart wins Bishop Strickland. We appreciate you being on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joe. Okay. Learn things about the Catholic faith. You never knew in Joe six packs secrets of the Catholic faith. There are many essentials to our holy and ancient faith that few modern Catholics know. Those essentials have become, well, secrets, hence the title Secrets of the Catholic Faith. Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, is always exciting, never boring, and completely politically incorrect. He never shies away from the so-called untouchable moral issues. With his use of humor and directness, readers and students can never get enough of what he teaches. According to Joe, there isn't one single teaching of the Catholic Church that can't be completely demonstrated to an inquiring mind. Everything can be demonstrated. But the Catholic laity aren't being taught these things. They're being fed pablum when they need and want meat. 
Secrets of the Catholic Faith is actually exciting, and it will make any Catholic's chest swell with pride. So get your copy of Secrets of the Catholic Faith by Joe Sixpack, The Every Catholic Guy, today in print or ebook on Amazon, Apple Books, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. A successful businessman was growing old and knew it was time to choose a new successor to take over his business. He didn't trust his children or any of the members of his board to take over, so he decided to try something different. The elder gentleman called together all his junior executives to meet with him. He said, It's time for me to choose a new CEO for my company, as I wish to retire and enjoy some of the fruits of my labor. I've decided to choose one of you to take my place. The young executives were shocked, but the boss continued, I'm going to give each one of you a seed today, a very special seed. I want you to plant it, water it, nurture it. Then one year from today, you will all come back to me with what you've grown from that seed. Then I'll judge the plants you bring me, and the winner will be the new CEO. A humble man named Jim was among the young executives. Like the others, he received a seed, and, like the others, he was excited about the possibility that he could be the next company CEO. He went home and told his wife, who helped him plant the seed in a pot with soil and compost. Every day, Jim would water it and watch to see if it had grown. After about three weeks, some of the other executives began to talk about their seeds and the plants that were starting to sprout. Jim kept checking his seed, but nothing grew. Three weeks, four weeks, five weeks went by, still nothing grew. Six months went by, and still nothing grew in Jim's pot. He just knew he had killed his seed. Everyone else talked about their tree saplings and tall plants, but Jim had nothing. He didn't say anything to his colleagues, however, but rather just continued to water and fertilize his seed. He so very much wanted his seed to grow into something, anything. Jim was discouraged. He told his wife he wasn't going to take an empty pot back to the boss's office, but she asked him to be honest about what happened. Jim was sick about it, as it was going to be the most embarrassing moment of his life, but he knew his wife was right. When the year ended, everyone was called to the old businessman's office with their plants, and Jim showed up with his barren plot. He was amazed at the variety of plants grown by the other executives. They were beautiful plants of every description in all shapes and sizes. When Jim put his dead pot on the floor, many of his colleagues laughed at him, and a few even felt sorry for him. When the CEO arrived, he surveyed the room and greeted his young executive. Jim just tried to hide in the back of the room. The CEO spotted Jim with his empty pot and merely smiled at him. The old man said, My, what tremendous plants you all have grown. Today, one of you will be appointed the new CEO. As the excited executives began to settle down, the old executive ordered Jim to come forward with his pot. Jim was terrified. He thought, The CEO knows I'm a failure. He's probably going to fire me. When Jim reached the front of the room, the CEO asked what had happened to his seat. Jim told him the story and about how he had obviously failed. The elder CEO told everyone except Jim to sit down. He looked hard into Jim's eyes for a moment, then surveyed the room full of other executives. Then he said, Behold your next chief executive officer. His name is Jim. Jim couldn't believe it. He couldn't even grow his seed, yet here he was being named the new CEO. 
The other executives began to grumble, asking how Jim could be the new CEO when he couldn't grow anything from his seed. The old man replied, One year ago today, I gave everyone in this room a seed and told you to take the seed home, plant it, water it, grow it, then bring it back to me today. But I gave all of you boiled seeds. The seeds were dead. It wasn't possible for them to grow. All of you, except Jim, have brought me trees and plants and flowers. When you found the seed wouldn't grow, you substituted another seed for the one I gave you. But among you, Jim was the only one with the courage and honesty to bring me a pot with my seed in it. Therefore, he's your new chief executive officer. Jim demonstrates to us what it is to be a true man and Christian, while the others have shown us how the world generally thinks these days. The other executives justified their deceit to be able to get the CEO position, the modern thinking that the end justifies the means. Only Jim had the courage to do the right thing. While the others thought they would get the new job on the basis of their deceit, only Jim was willing to sacrifice the possibility of promotion to remain faithful to his conscience. It's easy for us to do the right thing when there's nothing to lose, but it's an altogether different matter when there is something at stake. We convince ourselves that God will understand if we compromise his laws to avoid shame, embarrassment, and loss, but that couldn't be further from the truth. Compromise is the language of cowardice, and it's a sign of being lukewarm for our holy and ancient faith. Jesus said in Revelation 3, 15, and 16, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were cold or hot. So because you were lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you from my mouth. Christianity in general, and Catholicism in particular, is under attack throughout the world today, under attack like never before in history. There have been more martyrs during the second decade of the 21st century than throughout the first three centuries of the ten great Roman persecutions combined. Sooner or later, all of us will face a time when we will have to choose between God's way or the way of the world, like the Christian clerk in Kentucky who chose jail rather than violate our conscience to displease God, or like the martyrs from the first century to today who gave their lives rather than offend God. None of us expects death to come for us anytime soon, but death is no respecter of persons. Whether you believe martyrdom is possible is merely a matter of opinion. What isn't a matter of opinion is that death will visit us all, and we will likely never know the time or the place when it comes. Death could be from lingering illness or suddenly as an auto accident. It could even come through nothing at all, as it did for my 38-year-old son, who was seemingly in excellent health but just simply failed to wake up one morning. We must be ready at every moment of every day to stand before Almighty God in judgment for the things we have done or have failed to do in this life. The only way to do this is to know our faith, live our faith, and have frequent recourse to the sacrament of penance. Don't believe the world and its lies. Society and culture may change, but God and His laws never change. Paul said in Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's little doubt in anyone's mind that society in America is in a state of entropy and utter chaos. So what are you going to do about it? Wise families are preparing for that real caca hits the fan moment. Most don't know how to do it properly though. There's so much to think about when preparing to protect your family. It's overwhelming. In How Your Family Can Survive When Society Collapses, I've done all the research for you. In this comprehensive guide, I tell you everything you need to know to be able to protect your family and learn how to live off the grid. In fact, following the things I teach in this book will not only help you to survive, but your family will actually be able to prosper. Get your copy of How Your Family Can Survive When Society Collapses now, today while there's still time to prepare. You'll find a link in my show notes at cantankerouscatholic.com or you can go to the book section on the Joe's Stuff page. 
the Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from Archbishop Fulton J. Sheen. He said, I recommend that my relatives send their college-bound children to secular colleges where they will have to fight for their faith rather than to Catholic colleges where it will be stolen from them. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. A certain man lived a very wicked life and wouldn't hear of doing penance and amending his ways. At first he used to go to confession for Easter, but later missed even his Easter duty. His friends admonished him in vain. When the local pastor announced a mission in his parish, to put off his friends, this man said, After the mission, I'll begin a new life. I'll go to confession for the mission. The mission began. The church bells solemnly called out their invitation to the opening devotion. Scarcely had they quit ringing when the death knell, a bell announcing someone's death, was heard. To their surprise, the people learned that the very man had died who wanted to go to confession for the mission. God gave this man graces before, but he refused them. He went to God's judgment unprepared. Those who put off confession for a long time become accustomed to this practice and risk losing their soul. If you don't make use of God's grace when he offers it to you, he may deny this grace when you need it most. Frequent confession is one of the best ways of saving your soul. Leaving confession for once or twice a year is indifference and negligence in God's service. This has been The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.